The motherboard is often forgotten about as a high-tech bit of kit in most gaming PCs. It's the, the slab of fiberglass that everything plugs into, right? Well, yes, but it's also jam-packed with some amazing tech. So in this video, I want to walk you through the anatomy of a modern motherboard, and hopefully you leave here with a load of knowledge and a newfound appreciation for this impressive part of your system. Actually, let's start with the PCB or printed circuit board itself. That isn't exactly simple. For starters, these days anything with PCI Gen 4 or 5 are between 6 and 10 layer PCBs. As in, there are 10 layers of copper traces running through here. Yeah, that's kind of insane. That's in part thanks to the sheer complexity of these boards. This X670 board has four M.2 slots, an X16 and two PCIe X4 slots, IO out the wazoo, and something like 20 power phases in the VRM. That is a lot of connections to make, hence the need for as many layers. It's also needed for signal integrity. If you have two of those M.2 slots lanes run directly on top of each other, just one layer apart, you would get crosstalk between the two lines, corrupting data and slowing everything down drastically, so they're kept further apart. The next obvious point is the CPU socket, especially since now both Intel and AMD are using the LGA or Land Grid Array style socket. AMD have stuck with their naming scheme though, whereas Intel generally just call it LGA and however many pins there are, so LGA1700 is the current setup. AMD's AM5 socket actually has just 18 more pins for a total of 1718, although one key difference is the style. Intel opts to have a lot of their capacitors in the center of the socket and on the back of their chip, whereas AMD has them on the back of the board and the top of the CPU. So AMD basically has a, a flat plane of grid, uh, or grid of pins, whereas Intel spreads them out into a more hollow rectangle. The part of the board that powers the CPU is the VRM, or voltage regulator module, which is what takes the 12 volts from the power supply from the 8 pin connectors at the top and drops it down to the 1.2 or so volts that the CPU actually needs. The first part of that chain is the controller. On this board, that's an ASP2100R, a pulse width modulation or PWM controller that activates 13 total phases, likely six pairs of teamed phases and an extra for the RAM or chipsets. And each phase is made up of two MOSFETs, basically like digital switches, a diode, inductor, and capacitor. The MOSFETs switch on and off tens of thousands of times per second to regulate the voltage down to the right level. The more phases you have, the more power and more stability you generally get, and the reason for teaming the phases together is that the ASP2100R controller likely only has seven or eight channels available, so you run two phases or two pairs of phases from one control signal, and so you get double the current and stability while only using one controller channel. When it comes to the RAM, if you're running DDR5, the modules themselves have the power circuitry on board. So generally you don't need any power phases for the RAM itself, although with DDR4, you certainly do. Otherwise, the main thing with RAM is the track length. Each of the tracks need to be the exact same length so that all of the data arrives at the same time. I mean, at 5600 mega transfers per second, that is just 0.17 nanoseconds apart. As in 0.2 of a nanosecond between each new 64-bit byte coming in. You can see the rather um, squiggly lines, especially from the central traces, as they try and match the length of the outer pins. One of the other most obvious parts of the motherboard is the chipset. These days, this is uh, somewhat of a glorified PCIe hub for all of the connected devices, although AMD thinks 
so much of uh, its use that on their X670 boards, you actually get two chipset dies that are daisy chained together for as much connectivity as possible. They often connect to things like the extra M.2 slots, USB controllers, audio codecs, LAN and Wi-Fi, uh, the X1 and X4 PCIe slots, and the SATA ports. For Intel boards, you will find a single PCH, or platform controller hub, which again connects to the CPU via basically PCIe and allows for things like M.2, SATA ports and I.O. to be connected in. Often chipsets can contain USB controllers natively, but more often than not, a motherboard will have an additional USB controller to handle some of the many USB ports that are often included on modern boards. On this B670 board, that is this little guy here an Asmedia ASM 1074, a USB 3.2 Gen 1 hub and controller, which runs up to four USB ports on the board. In this case, you can see its traces running towards the front panel USB 3 and Type-C headers, so this is the controller that your front panel case connectors will use. You'll also find hub chips too which aren't full controllers, they're, they're just a way to connect multiple ports to one port on a controller. On this board, that's a Realtek chip up by the rear I.O. Sometimes a signal isn't quite strong enough to reach where it needs to go for sure, so it needs a ReDriver chip. This board has a USB ReDriver chip in the form of a Genesis Logic GL9901, and to round off the USB chips, since this board has a Type-C port that supports some amount of power delivery, there's also a USB-C PD chip from Realtek up there too. Something you'll also find near the rear I.O. is the LAN controller. In this case, that is a Realtek 2.5 gigabit Ethernet controller, which is incredibly common now. Intel pretty much mandates a 2.5 gig Ethernet port now, and it looks like AMD might do so too. These controllers have become cheap enough that motherboard vendors are using them instead of gigabit controllers, which I'm pretty happy to see. Now, Wi-Fi is almost always done by an external module, either by an M.2 E key slot or a vertical mount like this one. Now, you might also be interested in the audio side of things. There was a big fuss about the audio section of motherboards around sort of Z97, Z170, basically as a part of the whole interference with other traces type thing, motherboard vendors started isolating the section of the board that the audio codec used. You can see the traces running along this thin edge of the board with a, an isolation line run into it from their actually hidden audio codec. I'm not 100% sure which codec they're using here, but the classic go-to is the Realtek AOC 1220. ASUS have also taken the isolation a step further and have soldered a cover on top to, again, in theory, keep out any noise from your, your clean audio. If your motherboard has video outputs, you might find one of these chips too. This is an HDMI level shifter. Basically, the integrated GPU in your CPU produces a frame, then the level shifter bumps up the signal to be compliant with the HDMI standard, and then it gets sent out via the USB port. This chip in particular was actually originally released in 2009, but has since been updated to support HDMI 1.4, full 24-bit color, and even has pins to control input jitter elimination features which is pretty cool. On the PCIe front, especially with the introduction of PCIe Gen 5, the connection is incredibly sensitive. I mean, PCIe Gen 5 is putting 32 giga transfers per second per lane. That is a new packet every 31 picoseconds. So it, it's pretty understandable that you would need those signals to be incredibly stable. That's why you'll find these Fizen uh, PS7101 Gen 5 ReDriver chips wherever there are Gen 5 connections on the board. That basically resends the signal, uh, which will add some latency, but means the signal is as stable as 
possible for reliable transmission. If you need to split some lanes though, a rather common requirement on boards with far more slots than they have dedicated lanes is for the use of a multiplexer. This basically acts like a two or multiple into one turnstile that lets you use the same, say, four PCIe lanes to run both an M.2 slot and an X4 you know, PCIe slot with, say, a network card. Basically, the data just takes turns in using the upstream lanes, which is actually one of the common functions of a chipset. Also, one of the interesting things that you might not have thought about is that Every function on the board generally has a dedicated chip for it. Hardware monitoring is done by this big guy in the middle, the big Nuvoton chip in the middle of the board. So all of the temperature, current and fan RPM readings all come from that chip. The fans are run by these linear driver or fan driver ICs. The RGB is run by dedicated chips. In this case, it is ASUS's own Aura 32AUO chip. And of course, the BIOS is stored on a flash chip, like this Winbond 256 megabit chip on the X670E board. And that is the anatomy of a motherboard. Of course, there is plenty more we could talk about, but I think that's enough information for now. If you have any questions, have something to add, or if I got anything wrong, please do let me know in the comments down below. If you want to see more videos talking about, say, this B6 760 board uh, and the, uh, the new chips that go along with it, check out that video already on the channel and on the end cards. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this one, you can hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. And if you want to support this type of content, then you can do so through YouTube and become a YouTube member, become a patron on Patreon if you fancy, pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one, or check out the rest of the affiliate links that are in the description. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that really. Um, if you have any questions, like I said, feel free to leave those in the comments down below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next video.